Welcome, everybody. Thank you for joining today's webinar. My name is Stanley Wu, and I am the coordinator for Omega and the director of the Resilience Project. This web webinar is hosted by the Omega Collaborative and is co-hosted by Randy Hayes. The Collaborative is a consortium that is working on the global poly crisis and includes the Millennium Alliance for Humanity in the Biosphere at Stanford, the Kranz Foresight Analysis Nexus, or the FAN Initiative, the Resilience Project, and the New School at Commonweal. We're delighted to be joined today by Stan Cox, a leading voice in the challenges of rationing and how managing increasing demands for water, clean air, minerals, energy, and food is rapidly becoming one of the greatest challenges. This conversation will be hosted by Joan Diamond and by Michael Lerner. And now without further ado, Joan Diamond. Well, I'd like to uh, welcome, first of all, the courageous few who are joining us this morning. And I use the word courageous because I think this topic is a quiet trigger for many people. For some, they just see us as being, or someone who talks about rationing alarmist. And the goal is to, you know, just turn away. For many others, it is too personal. It's where the collapse, the existential risks we're facing, the, um, you know, the threats to democracy, the environmental degradation, just come too close to home when we talk about rationing and our own lives. So I consider those who join us the courageous. Um, you know, here we are, uh, you know, within a month, I think it is, of hitting 8 billion people on the planet, um, increasing calls for no growth, degrowth society because of the lack, you know, being out of sync with um, our resources and our human needs and our human demands. Um, and, you know, the simplest equation we have out there is that of supply and demand. And what we're talking about today is those being out of balance, seriously out of balance. So with that, I think I will turn it over to Randy Hayes um, of The Fan, who um, brought um, Stan Cox to us today to help us, you know, begin an approach to this very difficult topic. One of my favorite in, uh, organizations is the Land Institute in Salina, Kansas, which was started back in 1976, focusing on, on sort of a global movement around perennial regenerative agriculture, but particularly at scale, uh, uh, given, given the amount of calories that the grains represent in the uh, 8 billion diet. So um, Stan Cox is at the Land Institute as a senior research fellow, fellow in their Ecos Ecosphere Studies program, but his background was uh, uh, in plant breeding at Iowa State, and he worked for the U.S. Department of Agriculture as a wheat geneticist for 13 years. However, a couple of decades ago, he joined the Land Institute and, and worked for a number of years developing perennial sorghum. Two years ago, he transitioned to his new position at the Ecosphere Studies as a research fellow and uh, has been working on the transformation of agriculture and getting beyond capitalism's destructive growth in ways that ensure sufficiency for, for everyone. He, of course, has a number of uh, technical papers uh, in his, in his uh, perennial sorghum and, and related topics, but he's written books on diverse subjects as as, as as a, an odd combination uh, from food and medical industries themselves to air conditioning, to uh, rationing today's subject and to uh, natural and slash unnatural disasters. So Stan, mm -hmm. we quite look forward to uh, your comments today and I'm turning it over to you. Okay, thank, thank you, Randy. And thanks to uh, everybody for um, joining us today to talk about a subject that uh, people uh, like to talk about uh, or, or uh, experience about as much as a tooth extraction. <laughs> but it's, um, it, is, uh, it is important. Um, and I, uh, so in 
before I uh, get into this, I, I first want to say I recognize that the problem we're, <clears throat> we're dealing, as you do, that the problem we're dealing with now is not only greenhouse warming, because that same bonanza of coal, oil, and gas that has produced about three quarters of the greenhouse emissions that now threaten humanity and the earth has, has also enabled the industrial world to transgress most other critical planetary boundaries, biodiversity loss, soil degradation, disruption of the earth's nitrogen cycle and others as uh, you're all aware. Um, uh, last, uh, well, uh, two years ago, uh, a group of scientists published a, a paper in the journal Nature um, showing that the accumulation of human produced mass, that is everything we've manufactured and built and is still around, has accelerated over the past four decades to the point of overtaking and now surpassing the Earth's total standing biomass. Our, our, the stuff we made outweighs all of the um, living biomass on Earth. This growth in production obviously can't go on indefinitely. Now, if this overshoot of planetary boundaries is to be stopped and reversed, our extraction of material and energy resources, along with other forms of ecological assault, needs to be tightly restrained, and markets aren't capable of doing that. Since the 1970s, efforts to limit society's ag aggregate ecological footprint by encouraging lifestyle changes, voluntary restraint in consumption, et cetera, have failed over and over and more dramatic measures are needed. There's long been an interest in uh, carbon tax as an alternative to rationing resource use. If we were talking about this in, back in 1990, with half a century ahead of us in order in, 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 in order to uh, rein in uh, greenhouse gas emissions, um, they, you know, we could probably talk about carbon, uh, carbon tax, but it's too late now. If we did want to hold global warming between the safe, uh, below the safe limit of one and a half degrees Celsius that IPCC estimated a few years ago. A carbon tax would need to start as high as $1,000 per ton and rise as high as 27,000 per ton by the year 2100, according to IPCC. By comparison, prices in today's carbon markets are laughably small. $6 in the European system, $3 for Japan's carbon tax, because that's all the market can bear without the, the economy breaking down. Um, William Nordhaus, a pioneer of such analysis, has concluded that even modest carbon taxation would be too hard on the economy. In his words, it would be, quote, unrealistically ambitious. The economically rational climate goal he estimated that could be addressed with a carbon tax would be a cataclysmic temperature rise of three and a half degrees Celsius. <laughs> so that's the logic of uh, economics. It's too late now to sufficiently reduce humanity's ecological footprint by focusing our policies at the point of consumption. We, we now have to focus at the point of extraction and production and then adapt our consumption accordingly. Um, now, and that means finding a direct, secure way to limit the quantities of fuels, minerals, and biological resources we extract from the earth and use to produce material goods. I'll describe uh, in a minute how that might work. But I want to stress here that if we did manage to reduce resource extraction and material production, um, successfully, the first line of response to the resulting shortages would need to be allocation of sources uh, of resources toward production of essential goods and services. We need to steer resources toward meeting basic human needs and protecting nature and away from production directed solely at increasing profits, which is uh, the purpose of production today. 
Such policies were administered in this country by the War Production Board in the 1940s. And it's been done repeatedly in the decades since under the Korean War Defense Production Act, most recently during the current pandemic. But even with reallocation of resources, production of essential consumer goods may not be able to keep pace with unrestrained demand. In the market, that would uh, ignite inflation. Therefore, price controls would be needed to keep goods affordable, as price controls were used in the 1970s for gasoline, uh, heating fuels, et cetera. But keeping prices low would stimulate even higher demand, which it did in the 70s. Uh, pitting consumer against consumer, and those of you my age will recall the endless lines at gas stations that were emblematic of the 1970s. This is where rationing then comes <laughs> in for the sake of justice and equity. The goal of rationing is too often misunderstood. This, and, and this is the most important thing about rationing. It's not a primary means of reducing consumption directly. Rather, it's an adaptation to existing shortages whether they're externally triggered as we've seen in pandemic time or if they're intentional, rational policy as I'll be describing here. They provide in a time when shortage is a reality, uh, they provide uh, equity and fairness. You know, uh, rationing does. Fair shares rationing of essential goods and services with price controls and income redistribution can ensure sufficient and equitable access for everyone. Uh, because resource consumption is strongly correlated with wealth and income, the consumption ceilings imposed by rationing require the affluent to make the biggest sacrifices. And the floor that rationing puts under consumption, every household being guaranteed a sufficient quality, quantity at an affordable price, can improve living standards for low-income households. For example, during World War II, per capita consumption of protein, calories, calcium, vitamins, all increased um, because people who had been um, uh, suffering through the, the depression and couldn't afford enough uh, quality food um, suddenly were guaranteed that uh, they could get a certain amount at a reasonable price. If we leave healthcare aside, other forms of rationing have generally been tolerated or even welcomed in times of shortage. Ration subsidized food programs are highly popular in low income countries such as uh, Egypt and India. People usually accept and readily adapt to water rationing. Uh, polling in the 1940s United States found strong approval for the wartime rationing program, often in the range of two to one. Now about that last figure, I'm, I'm not naive. I realize we're living in a very different time now, 80 years later, uh, when a lot of people are gonna howl if they perceive anything intruding on their freedom quote, and, uh, and politicians are you know, afraid to even um, bring up subjects like this. But that's a, a political problem. It's not, it's not a problem of it's simply not being possible to um, ration because we know we've, it's been done before many times. The empty shelf crises we've been seeing over the past two and a half years, thanks to COVID, supply chain disruptions has cried out for rationing, and, but it hasn't really been done. For a while, many stores did limit uh, the amount of, say, toilet paper you could buy uh, in order to prevent hoarding. But in that case, people could simply go to the next store and, and buy more. There's another difference between past and future rationing. I'm, I'm talking here about using it excuse me, as an adaptation to collectively imposed limits on resource use, not on, uh, say, in World War II with a rubber supply from Asia being cut off, but we're, we're, we'd be doing it 
by, by agreement uh, ourselves. If we do that, we'll be leaving fossil fuels, timber, whatever, sitting out there easily available, but we'll refrain from extracting them. To say the least, resisting that temptation would further complicate the politics of limits. Uh, and then finally, one more difference, allocation and rationing efforts of the past were ad hoc responses to unavoidable temporary resource scarcity. So measures were typically applied commodity by commodity as um, shortages or inflation um, affected the, those uh, individual commodities. Now with a global ecological emergency underway, <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> now with a global ecological emergency underway, we're confronted with the need to limit extraction and use of virtually all resources intentionally as a society. This is a dizzyingly complex problem. So where do we begin and with which resources? I've been arguing for some time that we start by rapidly phasing out oil, gas, and coal. Unlike other resources, fossil fuels have to be almost completely purged from our economies in the coming years if uh, Earth is to avoid uh, catastrophic heating from carbon pollution. And given how rapidly IPCC says we have to reduce emissions at this point, we, we have to snuff out the burning of fossil fuels, the beating heart of global capitalism, faster than we're able to phase in alternative energy sources to replace them. Capping and rapidly reducing fossil fuel extraction will inevitably reduce the amount of energy available to industry for production of virtually all goods. So that will, that will mean less exploitation of mineral and biological resources, um, unless we really do go crazy building electric cars and less production of plastic and other waste. It will require thoroughgoing societal adjustment, but it'll be a great relief for the earth. Now, a fossil cap would not substitute for other conservation measures or rights of nature laws. More logging bans would be needed, for example, to increase, to prevent the increased use of wood as a substitute for coal. In my book on rationing, uh, any way you slice it, I examined rationing of four things, uh, energy, uh, energy or carbon, water, food and medical care in the past and the present and, and, and around the world. Water rationing, almost always a local issue, um, would need to continue when and where it's needed. Uh, biodiversity would continue to require protection, whether or not global warming is curbed. But to get us started at long last on the road to global ecological restraint, a uh, declining cap on fossil fuel and extraction and uh, fossil fuel extraction and use would be a huge first step and it, it would be the, the, the biggest first step we could take. Then adaptation would have to come through planned allocation of energy resources uh, to uh, essential industries along with rationing to ensure fairness and sufficiency for households, for the uh, energy customers. For the past couple of years, my colleague Larry Edwards and I have been proposing a policy framework, framework we call CAP and ADAPT. There, you'll find a link to it in the paper that uh, you received for this webinar. Briefly, Larry's and my proposed policies would place impervious caps on the nation's total supplies of oil, natural gas and coal. Most importantly, those caps would ratchet down quickly year by year. Uh, uh, would ratchet down year by year. Under federal regulation, the cooperatives would allocate their diminishing allotments of fuel to society's various sectors, giving priority, for example, 
to power plants that might still be needed to supplement uh, renewable generation for a period of years for continued development of non-fossil energy capacity for uh, critical sum consumption such as for home heating uh, and for uses in agriculture and essential manufacturing and transportation. Uh, then in the consumer energy market, fair shares rationing would be needed. And in the uh, cap and adapt idea, and also in uh, a decade ago, uh, a thing called tradable energy quotas that they um, talked about in the British parliament and rejected as ahead of its time. Uh, and, and under the, this kind of system, each household could have an account analogous to a bank account, but not involving money. Ration credits would be deposited into the account each week or month with equal quantities per household, and then e either per person or per household. And, and then the consumer could use a, a ration debit card along with a cash or regular bank debit card, primarily, and this would primarily be used when filling the gas tank or paying utility bills but for, for other purchases of energy as well. <coughs> and energy frugal households, could either save their unused credits for future use or sell them into a ration pool from which they could be distributed um, equitably and free of charge to households that require additional credits. Although every community would be playing by the same overall national rules, kind of an, an umbrella of national policy with equal um, ration quotas for everyone, the system could be administered at the community level as local rationing boards did in, in the 1940s. Great, even greater local autonomy could be achieved by designating a supplemental pool of collective energy rations to be allocated by each community as a whole for the common good. As the total fuel supplies tightened under this kind of system and alternative energy system are not managing to fill the gap, ad hoc rationing with price controls could become necessary not only for energy, <coughs> but also for material goods. Uh, this would be another example of rationing and its proper role as an adaptation to agreed upon limits where it can ensure sufficiency and equity. There was much study and discussion of rationing among economist in the 1940s and then again during the energy crisis in the 1970s. Congress even passed a standby gasoline rationing plan in 1980, but then the supplies of uh, international supplies of oil freed up and uh, the uh, standby plan was never put into effect. Um, and uh, of course, today, rationing is a dirty word, especially in economics. In the past year or so, however, as climate projections become more dire by the day, I've noticed increased interest in rationing among academics, scientists, the general public, and even a few public officials. The well-known NASA climate scientist and activist Peter Kalmus, for instance, is now endorsing a direct phase out of fossil fuels supported by planned allocation and rationing, and uh, he's drawing support. He has a big following. Then at a committee hearing uh, held last year by Ireland's top legislative body, uh, um, I happened, Larry and I happened to uh, catch the, uh, the video of this, four prominent climate researchers responded to uh, members' questions, members of this, of the, um, the Irish Parliament, uh, with blunt, urgent policy recommendations. And these were the kind of things you rarely, if ever, hear from scientists who generally are quite conservative in what they say and reluctant to speak in sweeping terms. But um, one of them, for example, Barry McMullen of Dublin City University, declared that it's time for, quote, politically risky leadership because, quote, the scale and urgency of our predicament 
requires consideration of policies outside our previously self-imposed restrictions on what is thinkable. So we, are, we need to remove the self-imposed restrictions on what we believe is possible and have self-imposed restrictions on uh, what we consume. If that wasn't what he said, that's my <laughs> comment. Um, and that he explained requires rationing of energy to protect fairness and justice. He said, you don't, you know, this doesn't involve telling people how to use their rations. You leave it up to people to figure out how to best pursue their own goals. Uh, the other scientists made similar urgent appeals and, and members of the uh, committee, the politicians themselves responded positively. Um, okay, finally, um, here for the past few minutes, I've been talking about a national fossil fuel phase out, but what would be possible globally? There's a growing movement for doing that through a fossil fuel non-proliferation treaty, and it has drawn broad support among uh, academics and activists. Uh, it's, it's a great proposal, but I'm afraid that a global treaty like that is purely aspirational in a world where nations can't agree on anything substantial. You're not going to get 160 countries to agree on anything. And that includes the 26 annual climate summit so far. And I, I doubt that uh, COP27 is, is going to change that uh, tradition. Um, that said, though, I do want to mention one draft <coughs> from a global organization called uh, FASTA. It's a, um, there's the, um, it, it's just, uh, it, it, it's uh, Irish for the uh, future or something like that. And that's their email address. Um, they, uh, they're headquartered in Ireland. Um, it's the first proposal, un unconnected to Barry McMullen, the, the Irish scientist. Um, but it's the first proposal I've seen for a global declining cap on fossil fuels that I would consider potentially uh, workable. Um, and it would redistribute uh, resources as a, a side effect, redistribute resources to low income countries. Uh, then each nation would need to develop its own means of adapting to um, the uh, energy uh, the, um, dwindling quantities of fossil fuels by developing its own resource allocation and energy ration plan. So the kind of thing I was uh, urging for the United States, uh, each country could find its own way uh, to do that, to adapt to the uh, um, uh, phase out of fossil fuels. But sadly, once again, back here in the real world of government and politics, prospects for pulling back within ecological limits in the near future are pretty dismal. But if we and what's left of our republic can manage to pull out of our current, current anti-democratic nosedive and rise to become for the first time a a true multiracial pluralistic democracy. Maybe we can find our way as a society to live humanely on much less material production and, and consumption. I know that's a long shot, but I think we, it is important for us to acknowledge the depth of the transformation that's required, even if it turns out in the end that our society is not capable of that. Um, and this, this um, last uh, issue I'm uh, uh, just uh, discussing the relationship between climate and our anti-democratic nosedive here in, in the US and a number of other countries, as you know. Um, I, uh, I'm currently, in a, since April, in a monthly um, series at the um, City Lights Books uh, website called In Real Time. And then that's the URL, it's just bit.ly slash Stan Cox. Um, I've been examining this, um, both uh, the uh, keeping up with the uh, progress of whether we're going to turn toward uh, uh, 
toward true democracy or toward authoritarianism and um, talking to people in the world of climate activism about um, and, and you know, voting rights, other things about how they are um, adapting and plan to adapt if, if the worst happens. Um, and so I'm uh, looking forward very much to some uh, discussion here because this is a subject that uh, prompts, uh, I think, more questions than answers when, uh, when you're talking about it. So um, th thank you again for uh, uh, having me come in with you. Stan, thank you so much for a fabulous uh, presentation and also the extraordinary paper, uh, which is really uh, remarkable and very thought provoking. We have uh, two points. One is uh, we always believe in embracing our own errors here. And the, one of the reasons that attendance is low was that a lot of people had trouble signing in, it turned oh. out. And so, uh, so it's, as Joan said, the brave few. But in reality, there were others who tried to sign in. Some figured out how to get in. Uh, but that's our error. And it hasn't happened oh. before. But um, I'm sure there were a lot of people who wanted to be here. Mm -hmm. I'm so grateful we'll be able to post the whole thing and it will be uh, seen widely. So that explains in part what's going on. Oh, OK. Yeah, I think uh, the, there are some wonderful questions in the, uh, mm -hmm. uh, in the chat. But it, to me, I think a central one uh, narrows down to this even assuming that at a national level, uh, one could have a, a central government and a system that would in, uh, allow and enable uh, rationing for equity to take place. Um, and even assuming that there were some authoritarian governments such as China perhaps mm -hmm. that could uh, enact and assure rationing, it seems likely that a very large part of the world would be neither able uh, nor willing to do it. And that in a large part of the world that it would be price rationing uh, that would take place. So clearly you've thought about this. And I'm just curious, I, I think of uh, Peter Singer at Princeton, the extraordinary ethicist who has created the website and the book, The Life You Can Save, and who argues that ethically all human lives are of equal value. And so ethically, to extend your point about equity, uh, all human lives in all countries are of equal value. So even if one could uh, ration equitably in the United States, if we were attempting to ration equitably around the world, uh, the rationing would be very different. So that's a complex of questions, but I'm curious, how you have thought about that. <clears throat> yes, that's one, you know, that, that is the, the uh, biggest uh, uh, problem we face. And, and um, besides, uh, when, when the only thing around was this idea of a, a fossil fuel non-proliferation treaty, that um, you know, seemed uh, uh, just as unlikely to work, but, um, this um this uh festa group um the way they what, what i'll try to briefly and i may garble it a little bit but briefly explain what they are proposing um, there's actually a a group uh, of countries already called uh boga beyond oil and gas um uh ireland france uh Costa Rica, there uh, hand there maybe a half dozen countries who have a, a kind of a compact among them on um, reducing phasing out fossil fuels in their own economies. But you know, that's just a handful of countries. Um, what FASTA is proposing is um, <clears throat> probably a lot of you are familiar with the uh, concept dating back to the 1990s called contraction and, and convergence, where 
um, the um, affluent countries who have uh, high emissions, high energy use um, would re reduce theirs at the same time that uh, uh, low income countries who uh, probably I, may even have a deficiency of energy would you know, could be able to modestly increase their emissions. Um, so they're fast as proposing um, groups of countries like uh, to emulate uh, BOGA, but to um, to reduce the fossil fuel use by um, selling permits for extraction and sale of um, of, uh, of fossil fuels and to reduce the quantity um, year by year. And then the, um, the uh, revenue from those sale, that sale of permits would be redistributed on a per capita basis within that group of um, countries. And, and they, they were proposing example, they, these are just examples of uh, matching a, a group of uh, fluent countries with a, a group of um, low-income countries. And, and so having both types of countries in there so that there's a very significant amount of um, transfer of, of uh, revenue um, to allow, uh, for one thing, for the low-income countries to develop some uh, renewable energy policy and so forth. Then um, eventually these, what they call clubs of nations uh, that have, that are representative of the world as a whole with regard to income and so forth. Uh, uh, they, these clubs could start interacting with other clubs or merging with other clubs. And, and eventually, you now they were showing uh, you could probably get at least uh, uh, 80 percent of the world's fossil fuel um, use co covered by uh, by that. Um, now yeah, that that's a very tall order to do that, but they um, it, it's the best thing I've heard of for doing it. But that's exclusively fossil fuel, right? And your point is that this is a much broader yeah. set of issues. So the, yeah. it just seems that um, we can really imagine it in uh, a reasonably <laughs> reasonably well-governed country with uh, national control and that at the international level, it becomes a whole order of magnitude more complex and mm -hmm. obviously so. Uh, I wanna just turn to Randy Hayes who's thought about these things uh, and we'll come back to that. <clears throat> but Randy, what are you thinking about as you listen to this? One of the unattended arenas in social change is overconsumption reduction. You know, the World Bank uh, likes to think that its mission is, is, is poverty alleviation, but probably a more useful institution would be the World Bank of Overconsumption Reduction <laughs> in terms of solving problems. Uh, and, you know, Stan, in your paper, you, you, it's clear that, you know, you point out how, how market forces can't solve this problem. It's not positioned mm -hmm. to solve the problem, quite the mm -hmm. opposite. Uh, and it's not commonly understood that rationing can be an overconsumption reduction process. But when you mention that, that uh, the well-to-do uh, contribute mm -hmm. most, so to speak, or, or suffer, suffer uh, <laughs> harder, so to speak. And, and in your paper, you say that, that there were plenty of examples where um, uh, the underdeveloped, if you're malnourished, you're starving, you're underdeveloped. So they're not just overdeveloped uh, situations. They're, of course, underdeveloped. And uh, they, they often prospered in this situation. So in terms of that balancing of the scales and overconsumption reduction, um, I think a preponderance of humanity, if they thought of rationing in terms of overconsumption reduction, would, would find it a, a rather appealing aspect and, and um, you know, I just don't know if you have more to say about that aspect of it. <clears throat> um, yeah, certainly, uh, you're exactly right, um, Randy. Yeah, we've probably all seen 
uh, Oxfam's um, uh, plot of um, the human population uh, according to um, uh, wealth, and, and it's kind of shaped like a martini glass where the, you know, there's the you know, very, you know, 10% or so of the world's population uh, consuming or having almost all the wealth and then it quickly narrows to this little stem. And uh, that's, uh, that is the situation. And uh, that would mean that the um, very vast majority of people in the world would, would benefit from this kind of contraction and mm -hmm. convergence, not only for um, income and for uh, and for uh, greenhouse gas emissions, but for um, you know, pretty much everything. I um, and re regarding other uh, resources uh, and other than fossil fuels, um, you know the biggest danger there, I think, is a lot of the stuff that the rich countries are planning to do to. Um, um, adapt to um, or, or to try to replace um, fossil fuels. And uh, I'm, uh, I mentioned electric cars. Uh, the the que global quest for um, lithium, cobalt, and other metals that, uh, to go in the batteries of electric cars, especially, but they're also batteries for the um, so-called green electricity grid and, and all of that are, um, is, is going to, it's already leading to ecological uh, destruction and humanitarian crises, and it'll probably lead to um, uh, military conflict, especially um, out in the Pacific where they're uh, planning to mine the deep ocean floor for these nodules that contain critical um, elements for um, for this. It, it's just not, it, to take 250 million, a quarter billion uh, personal vehicles in the United States and say, okay, we're just gonna uh, swap those out for a quarter billion um, electric vehicles and not completely change the way that we, we move from place to place is, um, is uh, obviously counterproductive. And my, um, my one liner on, on transportation was simply <laughs> quadruple the mass transit in every large and medium sized city worldwide should be, should be the, the path yeah. forward. Right. Quadrupling mass transit and lowering the price yeah. as you do it, uh, you know, is the kind of systemic solution in that arena yeah. that I see. Mm. Michael? Uh, Stephen Marshall has posted a number of interesting comments and questions, and here's one of them. The injustice of the market system is that it allocates to those who have money and therefore less need, not to those who have the greatest need. The potential for rationing is to ensure that necessary goods are distributed by need, not wealth. This is the correction that I'm uh, looking for. And <clears throat> it seems to me that in addition to the, the point about how it can seem to work nationally, how global use of rationing is much more complicated, uh, but there are other points. So for example, one of the real possibilities all of us know is systemic collapse at a high level. And if there's systemic collapse, uh, then there won't be the ability to ration, obviously. Uh, but what will happen uh, potentially is um, that if money collapses, if everything else collapses, uh, that barter will become a fundamental approach to this. And because in collapse, it's at least possible that a lot of the higher income countries and individuals will, uh, will have a lot of uh, lowering of income and capacity it might even, it could result in greater equity. So it's just an interesting point. And I wonder if people have thought about it, whether collapse may be a, a road in a greatly reduced system 
to barter economies and greater equity. Makes Stan? sense. <laughs> makes, uh, makes sense to me. Um, <clears throat> and I think also the um, you know, within countries, the the uh, wealthier people are the um, as a general rule, it seems to me, the less they know about how to um, get by, how how to um, be resourceful, or how how to make things, or how to grow food, all all those things. And so, um, in a barter economy, the the people who know how to fix plumbing or whatever are going to um, in, in to, uh, grow wheat are, are going to have the uh, upper hand. I think that's authentically true. Joan uh, Diamond, have you had any reflections? Well, I just wanted to respond to these last two comments. I think that when that discussion is presented, often the response is yes, but the question is the path from here in the collapse to the barter society, how bloody is it? Oh, um, incredible. And, you know, are there ways to, so it creates this sometimes nice sort of vision of a more equitable world, but are there ways to, you know, ameliorate or reduce that transition? Because mm -hmm. the, the horrors would also then frame that new society. Um, Carlos Schulz uh, from Brazil uh, writes, market speculators being those that are not at all involved in the industry production distribution, but are only involved to profit. Absolutely, Carlos, that's, that's so true. Um, in the, uh, so Stan, as you have reflected so deeply on these issues, do you see benefit in uh, the high income countries that may have the capacity to do this, uh, engaging in deep rationing on their own, even if the rest of the world isn't gonna be able to do it effectively? In other words, what are, what are the benefits in a global system that can't do this if the higher income countries or some of them are able to and engage in it? How does that work? It seems to me that the high emitting uh, countries, which uh, almost all are also wealthy countries, it, it's a moral ethical obligation to do it, even if, uh, if we don't think that uh, China or India or other countries will do it because we, we have um, both the, the need a much greater need to reduce our emissions than most other countries and we um, we have the capacity to do it, it um, we have a big cushion from uh, the wealth that we've uh, accumulated mostly at the expense of the rest of the world um and and then there we, we also have a, a an obligation um and, and this this is something that would be built into the non-proliferation treaty to um, you know, provide financial assistance to countries that who can't afford to um, uh, um, reduce their dependence on fossil fuels to help them but both with um, you know, development um, improved quality of life and um, in uh, non-use of, of fossil fuels, um, the, but this the sort of um, uh, this sort of thing. You, you know, there's this commitment in the that goes back to the Paris Agreement, I guess, that the rich countries are supposed to give a hundred billion a year or put that into a fund for green energy development and the rest of the world and just and haven't been doing it all this time and I've been arguing recently that um, you know our country could 
cover the whole thing, uh, the whole hundred billion with just one tenth of what we spend on the military. And, and that, that's, you know, our priorities are, are you know, so upside down. Mm -hmm. Randy, uh, I've always loved your phrase. It's kind of a model for me. Sometimes I garble it, but your vision of continental networks of bioregional economies, that's been your vision for some time. How do you square continental networks of bioregional economies with Stan's proposal for rationing? How does it fit in your view? Well, I, I haven't put a serious thought into that aspect of it. Uh, but from the standpoint of, of you know, what bio and bioregional economies may be more vibrant than, than many people think already, say, in North America, a lot of a lot of tribal economies are largely bioregional and have a whole lot of bar bartering uh, mm. as, as aspects to them. And there is trade between uh, different um, different regions and locally produced goods and services. Uh, and it just strikes me that. Um, our agency, you know, becomes less and less the more we go away from uh, county government or city government towards state, towards federal, towards global. And at least if every continent developed its own continental uh, framework for these um, uh, bioregional economies uh, to provide, you know, the essential goods and services of a dignified life, you know, it's just an easy concept to to uh, wrap your, your hands around. And the best way to make that, um, I think of it as what will, likely, what will most likely happen if anything decent likely happens post, post larger collapse um, will be you know, that kind of a framework because there won't be the global trade that we, that we have now. And, and the best way to ensure that uh, something like that emerges is to roll up your sleeves and begin to put it together and, and uh, you know, paint, paint the portrait uh, and the vision right now. So um, because bioregional economies focus on more essential goods and services and less of the frivolous things like plastic toys imported from China, uh, then, um, you know, they're already focused in, in more or less the right direction. So rationing would be a decent fit. And, and as Stan, I wanted to point out that one of our colleagues, uh, Tom A., who follows the uh, COP process quite closely, uh, thinks that there's a bit more wind in the sail of the uh, fossil fuel non-proliferation effort. And you two might want to follow up offline on that. Um, yes. Uh, Joan, you mentioned in a note uh, the fundamental challenge of population and all this. Do you want to say more on that? Well, I um, is an acceptable answer. No, um, <laughs> but it but it is a fundamental issue. And as I mentioned in my introduction, you know we're facing the eight billion threshold, and still, you know we are not, no countries are really addressing the need. I mean, we talk a lot about degrowth and stabilizing population is almost an acceptable conversation, but not decreasing it. And um, even by, you know, very choice ethical, you know, I mean, there are a lot of good ways to bring the population down that, but, um, you know, I think we have to have that conversation out on the table and really be exploring, you know, what in our society is incentivizing people, particularly the wealthy countries where the, the footprint and the impact is so much greater to have, you know, so many children. And um, go ahead. Yes. Well, I, uh, oh, go, go ahead, ahead, Michael. Go ahead, Stan. Go ahead. I, on, on that subject, Joan, and, and uh, this larger uh, discussion of uh, uh, collapse and production and so forth. Um, I recommend to all of you a book just published by um, a couple of months ago by my friends, Wes Jackson and Robert Jensen, uh, uh, Inconvenient Apocalypse is the, the title of it. Um, it's uh, uh, kind of a, a 
philosophical look at how uh, assu assuming say that we're going to be um, eventually a, a planet of two mil or two billion people, you know, is there a humane way for, for that to happen? But there, I, there, I, there is I some good, yeah, there is some good research for it. And just maybe to to highlight the complexity of that. I mean, we can talk about a lot of you know different strategies and approaches, but in the last week I've had two friends um lamenting, heartbroken, tearful because their children are deciding not to have children. Mm -hmm. And, um, yeah. you know, there are just many, many things that need to be tackled. Yeah. Yes, uh, Jane Monkey from the uh, Food Packaging Forum writes, I think one of the key challenges is that humanity uh, lacks a shared vision of how the future should be because this will be fundamental for defining what is essential. People have very different ideas about this. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Randy, I, I want to invoke you personally in terms of uh, frugality. Uh, when I've run into you in airports from time to time on your ongoing international travels, Everybody else has a big carry-on and a big backpack and everything else. And you're wandering around with this little tiny, you know, sort of micro carry-on and nothing else. And it seems to me that somewhere along the line, you decided to, to practice this. What's it like for you? Are you still doing that? And what's it like for you to live with the level of frugality that you apparently do and that you encourage others to do? <laughs> I think it goes back to my hillbilly roots being from uh, West Virginia, where we just didn't have very much. Mm -hmm. So it never felt like a, you know, a great loss. Uh, but, and even in my couple of decades running the Rainforest Action Network, I never paid myself more than about $62,000 a year for a, a um, you know, 80 hour a week job. Uh, and so just keeping a low, a low overhead lifestyle, you know, it's just been my modus operandi uh, forever. And now it's 72 and a half, um, you know, it's just less to carry is, is a good thing. <laughs> so. No, but I think, you know, this... and with, and with, with international travel and changing planes, you know, I of course have to worry about my carbon budget. So I have to save a rainforest every now and then to justify my existence. Um, but you know, if you don't check your baggage, you know, you just got it kind of under your seat. Yeah. Well, but I can, I can do, I can do a two week trip in, in Europe, including a suit and tie meetings with what you've seen in that little roller bag. Well, there you go. It really has a kind of Gandhi-esque dimension to it that, you know, self-imposed, uh, ethical, uh, you know, grounds are, are, uh, are encouraging uh, toward a rationing point of view. Uh, Tom writes, Stan, you have not said anything about how the cap would be allocated. This is a particularly interesting question with it come, uh, uh, when it comes to extraction. The conversation on this is just beginning, including with the fossil treaty discussion. Stan, any comments on that? Um, well, if that means how the uh, the annual quota that could be extracted, how that would be um, allocated, um, that would be um, yeah, these um, at, at least the way uh, Larry. Well, Larry and I actually differ on that. I um, I, I believe that. Um, uh, nationalization of all of the uh, reserves and infrastructure of fossil fuels will be necessary that uh, the, these corporations aren't going to go with a business model that uh, requires them to go out of business within 10 or 20 years. Um, uh, and then there, there would need you know, these public cooperatives or whatever they are who take that over, there would need to be some uh, you know, democratic structures of some kind there to, um, you know, uh, to 
guide it. And, and it, it's true that would, that is a very complicated uh, thing. But I, um, we we you know we got into the discussion um, early in the pandemic of uh, what are essential goods and services you know which people have to uh, have to be, go to work no matter what et cetera um, and uh, so it, it would require you know, a lot of the same kind of calculations that the country went through during World War II um, uh, when they uh, took uh, automobile factories and converted them making tanks and, and so forth. But I, you know, I, I don't have a, a, an overall uh, answer to that. Mm -hmm. It's uh, Randy writes, uh, I have a two pager on the vision of continental networks of bioregional economies that might contribute to a shared vision. Randy, yeah, if, if you can know, uh, Oh, if you can share that somehow, that would be really interesting. Well, we're moving uh, toward completion. We're going a bit over the hour because we started with some difficulties for people getting on, and we deeply apologize for that. Um, I am left, Stan, with, um, first of all, how profoundly important this is, and gratitude to you and Joan and this extraordinary paper that you've uh, done. And as you said, it's like tooth extraction. It's not something people want to think about. But as you've also pointed out, rationing happens all the time. And it happens by price and it happens in other ways. So we're, we're just talking about more equitable uh, uh, rationing. And then the idea that it could be done in well-organized countries with some level of um, national control and capacity to do it is clear. And you've described how there could be clubs of developed, more developed and less developed nations that could gradually uh, increase to take in perhaps 80% of consumption in the world, which is a very promising response to the international dimension of this. I'm not sure we've addressed as much the question of the value of authoritarianism, sort of green fascism, if you want, um, where countries like China is such a good example, who really can enforce rationing, and in fact may be inclined to enforce rationing in order to stay in power in a situation where rationing is essential to keeping the population alive. Uh, so it seems to me that the question of totalitarianism or authoritarianism, green fascism, if you will, or green equitable fascism, as uh, one logical outcome of the rationing process uh, is one that uh, we need to address. And I wonder, Stan, since you've thought a lot about this, where do you come out on that? Well, uh, Michael, I don't, uh, I don't really foresee um, basically uh, benevolent uh, dictators managing to um, managing to prevail. Um, you know, China has, um, uh, over time, as they've grown uh, wealthier, the um, degree of inequality, which, which was extremely low uh, you know, you know, before, you know, back in the 70s, 80s, um, has exploded. Now, now there's a great deal of inequality. And um, even though um, they have managed um, to, like, like with the um, uh, COVID shutdowns and so forth, it demonstrated the, the power of the government there. I, it, it's hard to imagine a, a government like that that has had such great success becoming a world power and deciding to uh, uh, basically un undermine its global power by um, uh, you know, having a, you know, phasing out the use of fossil fuels and um, and and having rationing for uh, equity, it's 
Um, so you don't expect you don't expect green fascism to prevail. Mm -hmm. That's the point. No, and and least of all in uh, in this country because you know we uh, you know, we're heading in the direction of fascism and, and the people you know, leading that are you know, are you know the opposite of green and and uh, so that that's part of this um, series with city lights that I'm. Uh, writing about it, right? You know, what are going to be the consequences in, in this country? Yeah. Uh, Thank you. Yeah. Well, I'm going to uh, turn to Randy and then Joan and back to Stan for final comments. Uh, this has been an extraordinarily productive and interesting conversation. Uh, Randy, your last reflections on the conversation. Oh, if I could write a... Um... $3 million check, I would allocate a million dollars a year just to a public relations campaign over the next three years to popularize the positive aspects of this approach uh, to deal with the, with, with the crisis, uh, many of which are, are well articulated in, in Stan's paper. So to those who haven't had a chance to read that paper, I really recommend that you do so, as well as his book on rationing. And uh, I'm just um, very excited to have this discussion today. I can imagine that we could think of more specific follow-up aspects of it down the line. So, Joan? Well, I would just like to thank all of you for what has been a very provocative and thought um, and, and challenging conversation. So um, thank you, Stan, and thank um, the guests and thank the comments. Wonderful. And Stan, your last reflections. Well, I, you know, people, um, you know, when they give talks and so forth, you know, they always say, but um, what can give us hope? We, we need to, um, you know, is, is there hope, et cetera? And I, and I, uh, Kind of um, not not very helpful answer is uh, it, it all depends on what you're hoping for. If you're hoping for this world that grew out of the fossil fuel bonanza to continue in, indefinitely into the future, then um, you know there there's no hope. But but if you're hoping for a, a, a degrowing world in, in which the, the goals are um, you know, humanitarian and where it, the, to the extent possible that uh, decent living standards can be maintained with, without destroying nature, uh, then I think there's plenty to do to work toward that. Thank you. And uh, my final reflections, first of all, just deep gratitude to you, Stan and Joan, for taking us into uh, a profoundly important subject, uh, which which we know people don't want to think about. Um, but uh, Stan, your paper is just brilliant on it with its historical references. And I, I just think uh, even though this is hard for people to think about, we're in a world of things that are hard to think about. And that's what the work of the FAN Initiative and uh, Omega and the Millennial Alliance for Humanity and the Biosphere, that's what we're designed to think about. I happen to uh, have a somewhat different view on, uh, on the future prospects of eco-fascism, because um, I think if we really look at it, if you look back at the Nazis, the Nazis actually had some green ideas, you know. They had they had some green ideas. They thought about it. Um, you know, people don't like to remember also that they were into Tibetan Buddhism. So there were a, a whole series of progressive, from our point of view, tropes in fascism, both ecological and spiritual, that we tend to forget about. And it just seems to me that there will be a increasing interest in enforcing limits, uh, limits to growth, limits to uh, consumption, limits to production that will come from, uh, quote, well-meaning uh, people who see the need to do this and have the power to enforce it. 
And I can imagine um, uh, authoritarian regimes uh, that come into power with the promise to do this equitably and uh, with a vision that this is how they stay in power. So you may be right, Stan, that that won't happen, mm -hmm. uh, but my crystal ball says that there may be countries and places where uh, some version of eco-authoritarianism uh, takes a run at it. Uh, and uh, so I look forward to continuing the conversation yeah. and with deep gratitude to the FAN Initiative, Millennial Alliance for Humanity in the Biosphere, Randy Hayes, Stan Cox. Don't take it, don't, don't, don't. 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 River is a healer. The river is a saint. The river knows.